Hello again and welcome to FateWorks. I'm Jim Grant. It's my pleasure every month to bring you a person whose work and their passionate faith are blended together. Their work is their faith. Their faith is put into works. Today we have a very special guest, Abdul Shadid Muhammad, happens to be the founder of the Muslim American Chaplains Association. And he'll be sharing with us all of his experience as a chaplain and as a president of this organization in which he'll share how chaplaincy is a ministry that impacts inmates across our state in a way that their faith is enriched, be it by a chaplain that is Islamic, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant. But he'll be speaking, obviously, as a Muslim chaplain leader. Abdul, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. I wonder if you could begin by telling us something about this wonderful organization that you founded, the Muslim American Chaplains Association. Thank you very much, Jim. I am honored and so happy to have this opportunity to uh, be on your show. Uh, MECA, uh, M-A-C-A, is the acronym for Muslim American Chaplains Association. It is an organization that was established for the professional training of Muslim chaplains. In order that we would be able to put in institutional environments to include uh, as well uh, beyond California Department of Corrections, California State Hospitals, Juvenile Justice, which formerly was known as CYA, California Youth Authorities, and developmental um, um, uh, hospital for dis disorders and, and, and patients. So what we function with is what we term inmates, patients, and wards. Uh, so that responsibility on behalf of Mecca is to make sure that we have candidates that are qualified, candidates that are going to be functioning within the guidelines of uh, the various titles for these various institutions, operation manual, as well as operation procedures, and that they are also responsible for maintaining the safety and security of the institution with all of the other staff. Now, you have served personally for 21 years in at least four different institutions, one of them that I visited in Soledad. But you've not only been in Soledad, you've been in Corcoran State Prison, Avenal State Prison and the um, Kern Valley State Prison in Delano, all located in our diocese, which is the most incarcerated diocese in the world. I was going to say United States, but we have more prisons than any other diocese on the earth. Tell us about a little bit the duty, the roles, the obligations, the ministry of chaplains. Yeah, well, chaplains are responsible for a unique niche in the uh, complex of institutionalized person in that we are responsible for the spiritual psyche as well as the psychological, mental, and physical aspects of improving and helping them to empower their lives to live functionally and be able to hopefully prepare themselves for the potential of eventual paroling or being released. Sometimes that's a few years, sometimes that's decades, and sometimes never. But our responsibility is to meet their psychoanalytical needs. And that ranges from, of course, uh, death notifications to interest and desire to commit suicide, also family matters, which are uh, major in, in the sense of uh, their families and their uh, children welfare. So we, we have that and our mainstay, if, if you will, would be providing uh, uh, the, the congregational worship as well as counseling, group counseling, individual counseling and uh, encouraging them to pursue those opportunities and avenues in that environment that get them compatible to uh, meeting their boards, parole boards, et cetera, for being given positive consideration 
for release because they have met certain institutional management requirement, certain institutional educational requirement, and of course, being able to co-function harmoniously in a very difficult environment. Can you tell us a little bit about why and when the California State Chaplaincy was created? Actually, that's a good question. California State Chaplaincy was created relative to uh, 1931, which I think is about 68 years ago, for the professional chaplain to be able to come in and meet, first of all, the constitutional obligation of the state. As we know, the First Amendment is a federal constitution that covers religious rights for all, and that includes incarcerated people. Now, a lot of people will say, why worry about giving them religion? Well, the fact is, man changes in his soul, and if he doesn't change there, he probably won't change, period. So getting him to change in his soul or bringing him in connection with his God consciousness, his God fearingness, once again, he can get back on the track of being a true human being that is with compassion and caring and an interest to aid and assist his fellow man and be a very integral part, integral part of the society in a positive way. So in 19, I believe it was um, 57, the official civil servant position was created for chaplains, which includes the Native American as well as the Jewish, the Muslim, Catholic, and Protestant, uh, and, and, and others. And we have uh, the need also continuously for volunteer support because it's such a, uh, these institutions are so large. And, and, and the population um, are with their uh, particular uh, educational formats and other things going on, jobs that go on, that they cannot always get to the chapel at the prescribed time for a particular faith service. So with the volunteers, there is an additional component that makes access to religious needs uh, available, and, and our volunteers do a great job, and, and we appreciate them dearly. Speaking specifically of Muslim chaplains, what would be their role in correctional and health agencies for you as a Muslim? Right. The role of the Muslim chaplain would be, number one, to make sure we take care of the obligatory faith um, mandates. And number one for the Muslim chaplain would be to facilitate the Juma prayer service, Common Language Friday prayer. Uh, and that's every week, just like you have the Sabbath on Sunday. And um, um, the two Pacific holidays of the Muslim, the Eid al Fitr, completing the end of Ramadan, and Eid al Aha, completing, of course, the pilgrimage season of Hajj to Mecca. And Eid is simply saying reoccurring uh, joy, reoccurring happiness, being renewed. And um, this is where uh, it is very important for these particular uh, populations are what we'll call uh, flock in, in common language, yeah. are able to meet their uh, religious requirement. And it gives them the opportunity to grow because in all faith groups we have specific holidays. These holidays are not just something that is what we call uh, wishy-washy. In these environments, these holidays are very significant oh, yeah. and they make a tremendous impact on what we will call the potential for rehabilitation of a ward, a patient, or an inmate. Speaking of inmates, is it possible that your Muslim chaplains along with other chaplains can actually minister or offer professional pastoral counseling and help even to the, um, the correctional officers? Is that something that the staff can be impacted? Yes, that is, and, and it, it is something that infrequently becomes uh, a request of a staff. Uh, something tragic has happened or something that has been uh, a family matter uh, that has been, uh, uh, let's say, a very stressful and worrisome and, and even, let's say, psychological ongoing problem. Uh, you know, people go through divorces, they go through death in the family, and obviously there's the 
pastor for the outside at the church, at the synagogue, at the mosque. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they are working, and they may, may not have that opportunity to get to that church or to that synagogue or that mosque. And their stress and their, uh, let's say, uh, grief is so severe that they want to have some religious counseling. They want to be able to engage with someone on a spiritual basis. Not that there's any interest to uh, convert them, but simply console them and be a, a, a spiritual advisor for them. They're telling me, Imam, that we've reached the half point of our program today. So I want to tell everyone we'll be back in a minute. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how Islam and the Diocese of Fresno have been partnering for a long time. And I think um, Muhammad is going to share with us very well how it is that we are going to celebrate with Bishop Ochoa a wonderful celebration in October. Stay tuned. We'll be back in one minute. Connect with Catholic Television on Facebook and YouTube for program updates and special features. Like us at Facebook.com slash KNXT49 and subscribe to our channel at YouTube.com slash KNXT1. Hello again and welcome back to FaithWorks. I'm so glad to be here with Imam Muhammad who's going to share with us something much more personal than in the first half. That was talking more about Muslim chaplains, but let's talk about the connection you have with the diocese, Imam, because that's where we first met. You were so excited about how we're going to be invited to a celebration and how it goes back in time, this wonderful connection, beginning with Bishop Steinbach. Can you begin by telling us how it is that the diocese and your group have been relating? Thank you, Jim. Actually, you're right. I am excited. And our relationship goes back as far as uh, 1995 in a formal way. And uh, we um, had an excellent relationship with Bishop Steinbach. May God be pleased with him in Grand Paradise. And we had uh, that relationship not only with him, but with him and Imam Warthi Muhammad. And for those who don't know about Imam Warthi Muhammad, Imam Warthi Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, actually transition the African-American indigenous Muslim from what the, was known as the Nation of Islam, media term black Muslims, <laughs> and the uh, somewhat uh, radical days of, um, uh, uh, of the early development of Islam, which was unorthodox. So the Imam brought us to orthodox Islam, and with that began to reach out in his leadership to establish genuine relations with Christian leadership and communities, Jewish leadership and communities, as well as, as Muslims and others. Uh, so he literally became a global icon in the world as one of the foremost religious leaders of his day and time. And, and of course, uh, Bishop Steinbach um, was so diligent about serving the needs of institutionalized persons. Oh, yeah. um, I had an opportunity to meet him at Avenal, and we really just connected. And in, in a short form here, keeping it simple, uh, from that, when I had a, an invitation accepted from Imam Worthy Muhammad to come and be our guest at an event at Fresno State, I uh, reached out to Bishop Steinbach, and he was totally elated. He said that he had met Imam once at the Vatican. Oh my God! And that he would just be honored and thrilled to be a part of the event. But we had already did our uh, committee evaluation for religious leadership award, and he indeed was obviously 36,000 square miles, and oh like you said, the most prisons of any oh. area in the world. Uh, and I had a firsthand experience of knowing that the week before he was at Corcoran, the week before he was at uh, somewhere else. And, and he had this, what I would call, energy and total commitment to serve the needs of the downtrodden and even those who were what we would call the outcasts of society by way of their criminality. Now, we have this wonderful event that is on Bishop Ochoa's uh, invitation list. Tell us a little bit about this um, 
Religion in correctional institutions, rehabilitation begins in the human soul. The awards banquet that is going to honor our own Bishop Ochoa. Thank you very much. Actually, we will have October 7th and 8th at the annual training, certification training for Muslim chaplains. At the conclusion of this, we have a annual awards banquet. Um, this will be the, the 21st. And that banquet recognizes significant citizens by way of education, by way of religion, by way of politics, etc., for their service that had been unique and distinguished over the course of a year or longer to the community and to their constituents. And Bishop Ochoa, I had the opportunity of meeting him a, a couple months ago. Uh, I heard about him through all kind of circles regarding CDC ARA and beyond. And uh, one of our members on the selection committee had proposed him among eight other pastors. My. And by for his uh, responsibilities, his track record, and his consistent engagement in these institutionalized environments on a personal level, not by way of the deacons, not by way of exactly. the priests, yeah. by way of the bishop himself, <laughs> was totally impressive and amazing to me. And so I had the opportunity to reach out to his secretary, Mary Cardona, in regard to our interests and uh, willing t his willingness to uh, accept this recognition, which will be the, uh, the Interfaith uh, Collaboration Award. Exactly. And I don't think that, obviously, we, we do have a significant amount of great religious leaders, and they're making tremendous contributions on the community level, and that is wholeheartedly appreciated and needed. But we're talking about a, a, a cofactor here. This is civilian community as well as these environments that are institutionalized. You know, what's so amazing to me is to have received from Mary the idea that Bishop is elated over being invited and being celebrated. And yet, on the day that is chosen to be the celebration, and it has to be that day, Bishop, unlike many other people, or like certain people, have calendars that are immovable Correct. and has other commitments that put him serving God's people elsewhere years in advance, months in advance. And when that date came up, by default, I am so blessed that in his honor and on the behalf of the diocese, Correct. which is also the connection we want to maintain, is please step in and do this. So I want you to tell something about the importance of not only a connection with a person, but this whole idea of the diocese connecting with Islam, the idea of the Catholic community of the Central Valley connecting with Muslims, especially at this time in history, which is actually chaotic and in some ways uh, looking catastrophic. But we in our diocese don't see it that way. We see this reaching out to and partnering with. Tell us a little bit about the energy you see there. Great. I, I really appreciate those comments, Jim, because what we have to understand is this relationship with the indigenous uh, African-American community in particular goes way back and to a uh, number of, of dioceses on the East Coast that uh, 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 had a relationship with Imam Warthi Muhammad and also a component of the Catholic Church that is international, many people don't even know about, called the folklore movement, which is global. And that movement established by a beautiful uh, diocese, uh, I, I mean, uh, leadership uh, of the Catholic Church, uh, I would put her on the same level as a Mother Teresa. Yeah, she is of that caliber. Of that caliber. And um, from being a, a child in, in World War II and seeing the destruction and the death was, I would say, inspired by God to want to achieve something that will bring religious people together in harmony 
and it has faith looking at what we had in common and working with our commonalities to begin to restore humanity and improve uh, human uh, relationship by what is the foundation of human well-being and, and welfare, and that's religion. How did you ever get connected to Chiara and the Focolare movement? Because that's something that as Catholics we may or may not even know about. But I was intrigued when you called and you were all excited about Chiara and the Focolare movement. How did you first get involved? Actually, I was fortunate in that um, the imam was invited to the Vatican for the Jubilee, I think it was 1999. Oh, for the Jubilee year that Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II called, yeah. Exactly. And I happened to be one of the chosen delegates. Wow. And from that experience, uh, we, we had a, a week with the folklore community. As a matter of fact, they gave us the boarding. And with that community, ultimately, they uh, made sure that we had the appropriate chaperons for uh, various sites around the Vatican, as well as the, the Jubilee and visiting the, uh, the various uh, significant sites of the, the Catholic world. And um, and the Imam W. D. Muhammad had such a wonderful relationship with Kira Lubick that they ultimately merged wow. by the grace wow. and the I would call it the uh, blessings of the Pope to work together for establishing a broader and more greater harmonious relationship around the world with faith communities. So with the folklore, you have all faith groups involved. There's no interest of conversion. There's an interest of sharing. There's an interest of fellowship. There's an interest of uh, our heart being able to see that we are all one family with one form of matter. You can only have one God. So humanity can only be one humanity. <laughs> exactly, which is something that Islam and Catholicism really hold firm to. One thing I have to interject here about as we're recording this program, the Pope has just gotten back from his trip to um, Poland with World Youth Day. But while he was gone, there were celebrations of Islamic communities and the Catholic communities in France and in Rome over the atrocities that have been going on. But what is more important than the atrocities of certain people mm -hmm is the goodness of the Islamic majority mm -hmm. that came and prayed at Notre Dame and at the cathedral in Rouen and in Rome at different basilicas, right. praying with Catholics over the violence that is being, that is occurring in our world. But what is the upside of it all is the solidarity of people of faith mm -hmm. to combat the evil of violence in our world. I, I really appreciate your marvelous comments because, number one, uh, we cannot allow what is being considered the age of terrorism to take us back to the past tense of the Crusades. Exactly. And the Crusades occurred primarily because of lack of understanding and lack of communication. And there would be just a reactionary interest to go out and, as they say, an eye for an eye and a family for a family, uh, and, and it prevailed for a thousand years, maybe even a little bit more, simply because everyone only focused on what was being uh, atrocities by maybe uh, less than 1% exactly. that uh, had no um, bridge from the whole bigger, larger religious populations, Muslim and, and, and Catholics, Christians, period, to engage and interact and look at how we should really focus on the greater good for the whole of all faith, the greater peace that, uh, you know, blesses the future generation and bring about a world of, uh, of harmonious relationship, a world of people that love each other simply because they believe in God, not because I'm a Muslim, not because I'm a Catholic, not because I'm a Native American, but 
I accept God. And, and that's why I want you to remind us one more time about the gathering that we're going to have, something about the tickets and what could people do to attend the awards banquet for Bishop Ochoa. Thank you again, Jim. Actually, the uh, awards banquet will be October 7th, and uh, the, the event at large will be October 7th and 8th. The awards banquet will, the banquet will be the 8th, doors opening at 6.30 p.m. Uh, the donation on the ticket is $40. It will be held at the Ramada Inn, I think it's 321 North Fresno, right at Fashion Fair Mall, off of 41. You can't miss it since you exit on Shaw. Ramada is a neon sign right there. Makes me think <laughs> of Ramadan. It, exactly. And the, uh, the beautiful thing is the bishop uh, will, will have uh, elements there by way of the folklore, folklore community, and um, the, the Catholic chaplains and, and others uh, who without a doubt love the bishop and we love the bishop as well another gathering that you're going to join with the bishop is on the 9th of september there is going to be a gathering at saint alphonsus church this is a gathering called by our united states conference of catholic bishops and we're going to celebrate a mass at 6 30 on the 9th of september at saint alphonsus in which we're hoping to help see that the need of our country is so great at this time of working together with our brothers of every faith to bring a, a, to us harmony, unity, compassion, forgiveness, and peace. Yes. And I'm so glad that you're going to join with Bishop on that day as we celebrate at St. Alphonsus. I'm glad too, because really the reality is the more the religious communities can come together and enlarge our uh, circle of influence, our, our connection with each other, the greater good we're going to see. And ultimately, the, what I know is going to happen in our lifetime, the end of all of this uh, madness by the heretics, the lunatics, the fanatics, that does not represent the whole, does not even represent a fragment of these various faith communities or any aspect of the leaderships of these faith communities. Thank you, Imam, for being here today. A blessing, and thank you for watching. We hope you will join us next month for another edition of FaithWorks. Till then, God bless.